So ions are atoms which contain an electronic charge. And the reason that they have an electronic charge is because there is some discrepancy with the number of bonds that they're making. So neutral atoms have what I've called the correct number of bonds, or the correct valency. Um, what do we mean by this? Well, if we look at the periodic table, we can see by looking at the outer shell electron configurations that everything over on the right-hand side, all the noble gases, have a closed shell configuration. They are perfectly happy, they have no desire to make any bonds, and as a result, they're chemically unreactive. So achieving this closed shell configuration is what atoms will generally try and do. All the other atoms in the periodic table are going to have to form bonds in order to achieve that closed shell configuration. So if we move across to the halogens, uh, the next column across, um, we'll notice that all of our uh, outer shell configurations are P5. So 2P5, 3P5, 4P5. Therefore, they need to gain one electron to get them to a closed shell configuration. So 2P6 or 3P6. As we move further across the periodic table, we find that you need to gain more electrons. So oxygen and sulfur would like to gain two electrons because they're only 3p4 or 2p4. Nitrogen and phosphorus would like to gain three electrons. Eventually we get to carbon and silicon, um, which would like to gain or lose four electrons. And this means that while the noble gases are unreactive, halogens would like to make one bond, uh, oxygen and sulfur would like to make two, nitrogen and phosphorus would like to make three, carbon would like to make four. Now, carbon is the tipping point, because at this point, it doesn't really matter whether it gains or loses four electrons. It can achieve an open shell, a closed shell configuration both ways. So it can gain four electrons and achieve a 2p6 configuration, or it can lose four electrons and go back to 1s2. So as we move to the left of, the, of carbon in the periodic table, we'll find that now elements want to lose electrons, so boron and aluminium want to lose three electrons because that's the simplest way to get to a closed shell. Um, the alkali earth metals will want to lose two electrons and the alkali metals will want to lose one electron. Now if we look at a neutral molecule uh, where all of the atoms are neutral, we can see that it's neutral because all of the atoms are making the correct number of bonds. So oxygen in this case is making two bonds, carbon is making four, all of the hydrogens are making one bond each, and nitrogen's making three. So everybody's perfectly happy, everybody's got a closed shell configuration. If we move to a, a charged species, an ion, so this is hydronium ion, we can see that all of the hydrogens are making the correct number of, of bonds, but the oxygen is not. The oxygen's making too many bonds, uh, and it's positively charged as a result. This is a carbocation, so even though all of the hydrogens are implicit, what this positive charge here is telling us is that this carbon uh, is only trivalent. It doesn't have a hydrogen attached to it. Uh, there's an empty p orbital on this carbon, um, and as a result, this is positively charged, uh, and it's not making enough bonds. Borohydride over here. The boron atom is making too many bonds, and it has a negative charge as a result. And acetate over here, the oxygen is not making enough bonds and it has a negative charge as a result. So over here we have species which are making too many bonds, this one's making too many bonds, and these two here aren't making enough bonds, but they have a mixture of positive and negative charges. So how do we know what's going on? So we said at the beginning ions have the wrong number of bonds, but we can classify this. They've either got too many bonds, they are hypervalent, or they have too few bonds, they're hypovalent. And if we categorize them as cations or anions, we can say that cations don't have enough electrons and anions have too many. So here's some examples of hypervalent cations. So these are all species where the atom in question, or the ion, is making too many bonds and as a result has developed a positive charge. It's lost electrons. So we have many examples of oxygen. So oxygen making three bonds, we have examples of nitrogen making four bonds, uh, and a slightly more unusual example of bromine making two. If we move across to the hypervalent anions, um, these are slightly uh, rarer, but the ones that are sort of important for these modules are borohydride, um, which is a strong reducing agent, and boron in this case is uh, making too many bonds, um, but it's anionic because it has too many electrons. And this aluminium tetrachloride ion, uh, which is a, 
a mechanistic intermediate in a lot of Friedel Crafts reactions. If we move on to the hypovalent uh, ions, then hypervalent cations, there's quite a few. Um, so H plus is uh, the sort of simplest example, but a lot of the metal ions, so sodium plus, potassium plus, um, these would like ideally to make one bond. They're not making any bonds, so therefore they are hypovalent. Um, and they have lost electrons, um, presumably to the, uh, the anion in the salt, um, so they are hypervalent cations. Um, we'll also come across hypovalent carbocations. So as we saw before, these are things like T-butyl cation, where we have three substituents on carbon uh, and an empty p orbital, which is causing it to be cationic. But we have a, a lack of electrons here. If we move across to the hypervalent anions, um, we're now looking at um, things where nitrogen is making two bonds, um, carbon is making three bonds again, but this time it's gained some electrons as opposed to giving them away. Oxygen's making one bond and has taken a pair of electrons, and all of the halides, so fluoride, chloride, bromide, uh, and any alkoxides as well. These are examples of, of hypervalent anions. So how do we form these different types of ions? Well, if we deal with the hypervalent ones first, we know that they need to gain a substituent because a hypervalent ion has too many bonds, so it must gain a substituent from somewhere. Now, in the case of hypervalent cations, um, it gains a substituent by using a non-bonding pair of electrons, um, and this is generally a lone pair to form the new bond. So here's a classic example. We take water and we react it with HCl. So water uses its lone pair of electrons to pick up a proton from HCl, and what we end up with is a hypervalent cation, because oxygen has overstretched itself, it's used a pair of non-bonding electrons to form a bond, and as a result has three bonds and a lack of electrons, um, and therefore it's hypervalent cation. Now to balance this equation, we've also created a hypovalent anion in the, in the, the form of chloride. So if we look at anions, we know again that we need to gain a substituent, but now we need to accept electrons into a non-bonding orbital. So this needs to be an empty orbital in this case, uh, because we can't accept electrons into a filled orbital, um, and we're going to form a new bond that way. Now, the sort of, uh, one of the few examples of this, I guess, is borane, so BH3. Um, if we treat that with sodium hydride, we are pushing electrons onto an empty p orbital on this boron atom. Um, and as a result, boron becomes hypervalent, it has too many bonds, but it's gained a pair of electrons from, this, uh, from the sodium hydride. So we've created a hypervalent anion in borohydride, and to balance the equation, we've created a hypovalent cation in the form of sodium plus. So if we look at the hypovalent ions, we know that we need to lose a substituent, uh, because hypovalent ions aren't making enough bonds. So, in the case of hypovalent cations, when we lose the substituent, we need to lose the pair of electrons from that bond. So that pair of electrons needs to go away from our molecule. So, if we take T-butyl bromide as an example, uh, we can push the electrons from this carbon-bromine bond onto bromine, which breaks the carbon-bromine bond. Because the electrons have left with bromine, uh, that leaves us with a carbocation, leaves us with an empty p orbital, that's a hypovalent cation. And to balance the equation, we've also created bromide, uh, which is a hypovalent anion. If we look at anions now, we need to lose a substituent, but in this case, we need to keep the pair of electrons from the bonds. Now, classic example of this is deprotonation. Uh, the vast majority of the time, this is going to be deprotonation. So we've taken our carboxylic acid here, treated it with a mild base in the form of triethylamine, and we are breaking this OH bond. So oxygen is losing a substituent, but it's gaining a pair of electrons from the OH bond. And as a result, we end up with a hypovalent anion. And to balance the equation, we've created a hypervalent cation in the form of triethylammonium. So... We've discussed how these types of ions form, but how do they react? How do we get rid of them? How do we neutralize them? Well, 
If we look at our statements that we've just made about gaining and losing substituents and keeping and losing electrons, all we can do is swap these two over and swap these two over. And that's how we basically neutralize our ions. So if we look now at hypervalent ions again, they react by losing a substituent. They're making too many bonds, so therefore they need to get back to something that's neutral by losing a substituent. And in the case of cations, they need to keep the pair of electrons from the bond. So an example of this is the hydronium ion that we created before. We treat it with a mild base. We push the electrons from this bond back onto oxygen again. Therefore, we've broken the OH bond and oxygen has kept the electrons, which has satisfied this, this lack of electron density over here. And as a result, we've created um, triethyl ammonium. In the case of the anion, we need to lose the pair of electrons from the bond, so we need to push the substituent away with the pair of electrons in that bond. So this is uh, a classic sort of borohydride reduction. So borohydride really wants to lose a substituent, but it needs to lose it with a pair of electrons. So we push the BH bond onto an aldehyde in this case. That neutralizes our bor uh, borohydride back to borane again. Um, and as a result, we have now created a, a hypovalent anion. In terms of the, the hypovalent reactivity, we need to gain substituents now because the ions don't have enough bonds. Um, and in case of the cation, we need to accept electrons into an empty orbital. Um, so here's a, a sort of classic example. So T-butyl cation, we're going to react it with hydroxide and we can actually combine these directly. So we push the electron density from the lone pair on hydroxide into the empty P orbital on the cation and we end up with T-butanol. In the case of hypovalent anions, we need to use the non-bonding electrons that we now have to form a new bond. Um, and this is most often going to be things like alkoxides or um, carboxylate salts and things like that. So we take a carboxylate salt, treat it with hydronium. We then push the electrons from this non-bonding lone pair, pick up a substituent, and we've got back to a neutral species again. So if our ion is resonance stabilized, uh, and that's generally if it's got a pi system or a lone pair of electrons that can, uh, that can conjugate with it, we can have both hypovalent and hypervalent resonance forms of the same ion. So in this case, we've got a hypovalent carbocation, so we have a trivalent carbon here, and we're going to resonance stabilize it using the uh, adjacent pi system. So we push the pi electrons across, that generates the resonance form of this carbocation, which is still trivalent. So we've moved from a hypovalent resonance form to another hypovalent resonance form. If we now put in an oxygen, so we're going to stabilize this positive charge using the lone pair on the oxygen by pushing it in like this, what we've now generated is a hypervalent cation, which is hypervalent at oxygen. If we move to another example, um, this is what we call an enolate, and it's a hypovalent uh, anion based on oxygen. But if we draw the resonance form where we conjugate this through the pi system, we move to another hypervalent ion, only this time we're sending on carbon. And here we have a protonated amide, which is hypervalent, oxygen's making too many bonds. And if we draw the resonance form of this, using the lone pair off nitrogen to push in, then we end up with a hypervalent resonance form over here. So it's possible to have mixtures of hypervalency and hypervalency, depending on what you've got in your molecule. Where this becomes important is how you deal with this in terms of reactivity. Now, I've picked the example where we've got hypovalent and hypervalent resonance forms of the same ion, because this dictates what sort of curly arrows you're going to have to use in order to react these molecules. So if we treat this molecule with a nucleophile, then the hypovalent ion, we can directly recombine. So we can push electrons directly onto this, um, this carbon atom here because it's hypervalent. It wants to make uh, another bond. It's got an empty p orbital here, so it's ready to accept electrons. We cannot push a pair of electrons onto this oxygen here. Even though it's tempting because it has a positive charge on it, 
it's hypervalent, it's already making too many bonds. So we can't push electrons onto that positive charge. So this arrow gives us this product, but in order to make this product from the other resonance form, we need to push the electrons onto the atom that's adjacent and then push the electrons back onto this, uh, this oxygen atom. So we are still neutralizing the positive charge, but we're doing it by breaking a bond as opposed to by forming a bond. And that's the fundamental difference between how we deal with hypovalent ions and hypervalent ions.